Now I want to introduce John Bischoff, who's a professor in the departments of mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering, and the director of the Institute for Engineering and Medicine at the University of Minnesota, who will introduce today's plenary speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Will. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's delightful to see everyone in person. Uh, so I want to welcome you to our IEM uh, Innovation Week and also the De, uh, Design and Medical Devices Conference in particular. Um, I'm proud to say that our organizers will, uh, as well as Art Erdman, Paul Isio, and many others have put on this very meeting for the 21 years, as I understand. This is the 21st successful year, and I'm, we're all very proud of them. Maybe we can give those guys a quick round of applause. So this is really a wonderful example of how a tier one research institution uh, can continues to work harmoniously with our medical device industry here locally. Mm -hmm. And to highlight that relationship, the deans of the College of Science and Engineering, Dr. Dean Aline, as well as from the medical school, Dr. Jacob Toller, and I just had the pleasure of having a lunch discussion with our lunch speaker, uh, CEO of Medtronic, Jeff Martha. So, uh, this is uh, wonderful, and of course, uh, this will allow us to continue to build this wonderful and unique relationship between the university and one of the leading medical technology industry ecosystems in the world. The, uh, the Institute for Engineering and Medicine exists in part because of a historical endowment and the continuing support from our local biomedical technology companies like Medtronic. As such, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jeff Martha. He's recognized as a driven and innovative executive, ranking in modern healthcare's 100 most influential people in healthcare in 2022, and listed as the number one CEO in healthcare technology by the Healthcare Technology Report in 2021. Jeff received a bachelor's degree in finance from Penn, Penn State University, where he currently serves on the Development Council for its College of Liberal Arts. He was also captain of the Penn State hockey team and later inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. So he really is a, an example of both a healthy mind and a healthy body. Jeff joined Medtronic in 2011 and notably led the acquisition and integration of Covidian, the largest acquisition in the medical technology industry. And before joining Medtronic, Jeff spent 19 years at GE Healthcare and GE Capital. He's a member of the Business Roundtable and the World Economic Forum's International Business Council. He also served as co-director for the Task Force of Health and Life Sciences for B20, a G20 engagement group. Jeff became CEO in April 2020. Under his leadership, Medtronic is putting tech in MedTech, leveraging the latest advances in cutting edge technology to transform healthcare. Fortune Magazine named Medtronic among the top 15 companies for its 2020 Change the World list and recognizing its swift efforts towards the mint, uh, towards during the pandemic and listed the company on the 2021 list of most admired companies. Jeff is firmly establishing Medtronic as the undisputed global leader in healthcare technology. As chairman and CEO, Jeff leads the $30 billion company, 90,000 employees in pursuit of fulfilling the mission of Medtronic, which is to use technology to improve human welfare. Let's welcome Jeff, and we're excited to hear your talk. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's hard to follow that. Uh, first of all, it's really it's it's great to be here. And actually, the um, that the story behind that is, um, uh, you know, we have to one of our stakeholders, our investors, and 
and um, we have these quarterly earnings calls, and they, they can be a little rocky, they can be a little tough sometimes, and we get on there, and is it echoing there? We have a lot of products to talk about. I'm getting an echo up here, if you can dial that back a little bit. All right, so um, we have a lot of products to talk about, and we drone on and on and on, and I'm like, God, we gotta bring a little life to our earnings calls. These things are awful. They are so boring. My wife, my mom, everybody's criticizing how boring they are. So we started to kind of go to a, a more digital format, and all these earnings calls are on recorder. We do ours video now, and we start off with these little videos, and you know, it really makes a difference for investors. Uh, they really do like it, so uh, my team does an excellent job on this, but little story there, and, and uh, we, we didn't do it one quarter. Investors went nuts, and we, so we the drum line, they wanted the drum line back, so we have it back, and it's, it's fun. It's fun. So it's, it's really good to be here. Um, we, you know, uh, you know the, as Will was talking about, Alan, the, uh, the partnership that we've had with the University of, Minnesota, University of Minnesota for a long, long time, you know, it's intertwined, which I'll tell you in a second, with the, the, how the company started. Uh, and to this day, the, there's a, a very strong partnership, you know, with the engineering school, with the, uh, the school of, with Carlson School of Business, with the health system, uh, and it's just a, a real pleasure, and, and it's, a, it's a partnership that we treasure and, and you know, really appreciate the invite and the opportunity to speak here today. Um, you know, we're going to talk about some, some changes that, that, that we see in healthcare. But before we get into that, I'll just talk a little bit about, uh, so this is what we're going to you know, talk about today, is really the, the struggle that we've had over you know, the course of time in healthcare to, of making trade-offs uh, among these three things here, you know, quality of care, outcomes, lower cost, and, and, and patient access. So how do, you, how do you lower cost, provide access, and improve outcomes at the same time? It's, it's always been a set of difficult trade-offs, and I do believe where technology is going is gonna really make it much easier because you're not gonna have to do all those trade-offs, and that's what we're gonna get into today. But before I get into that, just a little bit of a fun story about Medtronic and how we're tied into the University of Minnesota. A lot of people have heard, I mean, we've got the Earl Bakken, uh, our founder, have heard about him, but the, the story of how the company was founded does date back and is very uh, tied to the University of Minnesota, a, a famous cardiac surgeon who's, it's not a coal miner, that's actually a car cardiac soldier, a cardiac surgeon there, Dr. Walt Willehy, um, actually approached our founder, uh, Earl Bakken, uh, after this big snowstorm, uh, Halloween snowstorm in 1957 that uh, cut the power uh, to uh, you know, the hospital, uh, at least part of the hospital, and a child that uh, was relying on a, 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 a wall-powered or electric, electrical-powered uh, pacemaker, you can see it there, well, I'll show you in a second, uh, it, uh, it failed and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the patient died. And so he approached our founder, uh, you know, Earl Bakken, to create a battery-powered pacemaker, and that's, that, that's what you see there. That's, that's, that's our first product at Medtronic. Uh, it's the first, you know, from what we, we claim, the start of the medical technology industry, right here in Minnesota with one of your cardiac surgeons and our founder, who was a, an equip, basically an equipment repairman for hospitals back then, and then Medtronic was born, MedTech was born, and here we all sit today. Uh, and, and, but that formula of an engineer partnering uh, with a clinician, and that intersection of human physiology and, and, and engineering is still the foundation of what we're doing today, I would argue, in the industry and certainly at Medtronic. Um, and now we've evolved into a, a company, I'm not gonna spare you all the details, that covers lots of different conditions, you know, using biomedical engineering, uh, as well as some new technologies as well, data science and others, to um, help out, uh, you know, cure, palliate, whatever, 70, you know, conditions uh, around, you know, uh, 70 different conditions, and we're actually treating 72 million patients a year. That's two patients every second. Now, we're very proud of that statistic, and that is the most important metric at Medtronic, is that two patients every second. But when you do the math, 72 million people is just a fraction of the world's population. And so we really, our mission compels us to do a whole lot more. Uh, and we, I believe that where technology has evolved to is going to enable us to really impact many, many more lives, move upstream, because today we're dealing with very sick people, move upstream to less sick, even high risk people, you know, and, and that 72 million 
I think that's going to get to a billion here uh, over the next decade, and it's technology enabled. Now, there's a lot of work to do there, but but you know that's where that's where our head is. Um, you know, just getting back to the pacemaker, there's the one on the far left is that that original one that plugged into the wall, and then we had a bit you know invented this battery powered one, and then you see you know you see uh, the evolution of pacing uh, through the years, and you know from a side that you know. It, it, these things aren't totally drawn to scale. That big one right, right next to the, the one under above 1960, that's a lot bigger than the one above 2008, but on this figure. But by and large, we kept the same four factor, form factor until about 2015, 16, when we launched the leadless pacemaker and disrupted ourselves. And this whole idea of you know, an engineer and a, and a clinician solving an unmet need, and then, and then and Medtronic in partnerships with clinicians all over the world, governments, Making that a standard of care, it's really what the company is all about and what's so beautiful about the med tech industry and that we do this on a fairly regular basis and it's really a special thing. Uh, and it, it, I, I think it's what separates um, medical tech technology companies from other technology companies, even other healthcare technology companies, ones that are uh, um, doing clinical research along with technology and making us creating standards of care, whole new standards of care, not incremental improvements, but whole new standards of care. That's a really special thing. And somebody who grew up in GE, uh, who was more of a, a, a technology company that sold to healthcare, not necessarily a healthcare technology per se, it's a big difference. And I'm not critical of GE, that's not the point. The point is what we do in medtech is very special. Uh, and, and, um, but I think we're at a stage now where we're gonna see a lot of change. Uh, and, and so that's what I'm gonna get into here is some of the, some of the technology changes. Here's a, 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 a very high level summary of some of the big changes that we're seeing uh, that's you know, enabled. There's the, 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 the battery or the, the, um, the new wireless or leadless pacemaker in, enabled by the electronic miniaturization and new battery advancements in battery technology. So we're seeing uh, us, you know, what that does is one, that, that pacemaker is implanted using a, uh, you know, a, a catheter versus a surgical procedure. So it's much less invasive a lot easier recovery for patients. So that is one of the ways we're making things much less invasive. Then you move over to you know, surgical tools and robotics, another you know, advancements in those areas that are making surgery so much more, uh, so much less invasive, so much easier to do, and things that you know, the human, you know, human hands can't do. And then you get down to the bottom two here where you're combining sensing technology uh, along with you know modern day data analytics, you know machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, all these analytics uh, capabilities, uh, and and you got uh, communications things like low energy Bluetooth or Bluetooth and and 5G, all these things coming together to uh, really um, open up worlds of possibilities here, which I'll get to. And the common theme uh, of of number three and four here is data, and um, so what we're seeing now is the advancement of technology. The, increasement, the, incre the advancements have happened at increasing rates, right? And, and it's, it's, it's the traditional engineering areas, bio, biomedical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical, data science, and, and that advancements, communications like 5G, what that's doing is enabling us uh, to, to really drive more of an insight-driven diagnosis, more of a personalized diagnosis, and then personalized but efficient care pathways for patients, uh, which is leading to the improved outcomes. So what we're, we're finally getting to the point where you don't have to trade off nearly as much uh, of, of you know, cost and, 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 and outcomes or access and outcomes. You can, uh, technology is getting to the point where we can actually do all three. And the pandemic has point, pointed out to us and the world that you know, throwing more people at it, it's not the solution, you know, in healthcare. And we have a, a, a supply chain issue with people uh, and, and it's not gonna be the, and they're, and they're also very costly. And so it, automating this and, and the addition of data, the prolifer proliferation of data, and then the, the analytics that we have now are really changing the game. And, and you know, this, this may be controversial to some people, and I'll come back, I'll say it now, and I'll wrap up with this, is this whole idea that, that when you talk to health officials around the world, they, they talk about for so long, the holy grail was population health. And I've come to the conclusion personally that that is just a flawed strategy and that healthcare doesn't work that way. 
getting cohorts of patients and, and trying to say, this is how we're gonna treat that whole, co that whole cohort, you get suboptimal outcomes and that's what happens. But now, I believe we're able to get to personalized care at scale in an efficient way with the way where technology is going. And it's opening up our minds and, 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 and that is where we're going and it's, it's at a very exciting time. In not just med tech, obviously there's all kinds of things going on in biotech and that's way out uh, uh, beyond some of my uh, uh, expertise. But when you double click on what's going on in, in biotech world, a lot of the advancements that are happening are tied to data and then data analytics, not as, you know, that are enabling these biologic breakthroughs that we're seeing and, and, and getting vaccines and things like that. So again, what I would argue, I would contend that we are heading down a path of large scale, personalized healthcare and delivering it in an efficient way, right? And the key ingredient is data. And what I tell my team, the cap, the limit on our ability to innovate is data. That the more data we have, the more we're gonna innovate. So that will, that, and the less data, the less we'll innovate. That's the rate limiter, that and our human capital, because innovation is still a people-powered business, and I'll come back to that as well. So here's a couple examples, real-time examples of what we're seeing, and, and we're on this kind of curve, but we're moving, that curve is getting, that, uh, the, the slope of that curve is getting steeper in terms of the advancement. This is a, a, a kind of a generic uh, way we're looking at surgery now, where we, uh, we just launched a, a surgical robot in, in many parts of the world. We're gonna start a clinical trial here in the U.S. Many of you have heard of the Da Vinci robot, and, this would be our version of that, you know, different design features, but aimed at the same set of surgical procedures. Uh, and we have a spine robot, we have a cranial robot, and you know, we're developing other robots to, to, to really, um, you know, change surgery here. But it's not just the robot. We, we use that term too generic. It's the ecosystem around the robot in the surgical suite that's really making the, the game changers. You know, it's, it's interoperative imaging, it's navigation, and it's, it's, it's AI enabled surgical plans that come through, you know, start with maybe an image, uh, an MR, a CT, an X-ray, and then applying AI to that to determine a surgical plan. Like I'll use a spine example. You know, there's a lot of math in, in correcting, a, the in determining the sagittal alignment of the spine that you, where you want it to go. And, and there's a lot of data over the years that determine, you know, what works and what doesn't, but it's, it's, it's very difficult. And so we now are using an image applying AI to that image to come up with a surgical plan, using robotics, interoperative imaging, navigation to execute to that plan. And then we're following those patients with images and we're seeing how, how everything worked out. And it's, it's just you know, super exciting to see the advancements here and how you know, uh, we're seeing surgeons with 30, 40 years of experience that thought they knew it all. They're saying, the AI is making me a better surgeon. Or you got the surgeon that just graduated their residency, just finished their residency, they feel like they've picked up 30 years of experience because of the AI. Um, so, you know, it's a very exciting uh, time here. Uh, in addition, um, you know, we're, we're seeing in, in chronic disease management, this is a diabetes example. In this case, you've got a, a diabetes pump, which now is more and more, you know, uh, driven by your phone, connected to your phone. It's got uh, sensors, you know, that are measuring your glucose and, and AI algorithms that are predicting changes in glucose and getting ahead of, of, of those changes. Uh, we've got, we, we, we bought two companies here. One is a company called Neutrino, which is an AI company that uh, drives a lot of our algorithms now and it helps recognize uh, foods and, and then it can automatically calculate the carbs in those, in those, uh, in those, uh, in those foods and, and really help with the algorithms. And then you know, we have another app called Clue that actually you know, tells you, uh, tells the app, helps predict and confirm when you're eating. All of this to make diabetes just go into the background of your life and uh, keep, especially young kids that don't car count carbs, don't enter that kind of thing. It just automates everything and keeps them within a certain blood sugar range. And it's a real game changer for us. And then one that's, the, that's you know, kind of, it's almost science fiction, uh, but it's not, is what's going on with the brain. Uh, and I was talking to uh, uh, Dean Kohler, uh, Dean Kohler at, the, at, at lunch here about this, is that uh, for the first time we are, over the last decade we've been working on how to listen to the brain and record signals in the brain. Uh, the brain is a very noisy space. 
and the signal to noise ratio there is like a million to one. Uh, and uh, we've learned how to record these signals in the brain, okay? Uh, and so for years and years, we've been stimulating parts of the brain to treat diseases, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's uh, and essential tremor. Uh, but we did it through a very empirical method of just kind of playing, not pl I'm oversimplifying it, but experimenting on what energy, where you apply it, how much, and what kind of waveform, and seeing how the patient reacts. And it's taken decades to get to where we are today. And now, for the first time ever, we're implanting devices that can record signals in the brain. And now we can correlate, listen to the brain, and correlate uh, how the body reacts to the energy that we're applying. And then, in real time, change it to optimize the therapy for that patient. And uh, the therapy is getting better, it's getting more personalized, but more importantly, we're learning how the brain and the central nervous system work because we can now listen to it. Uh, and it's kind of like, you know, you're, 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 you're like you to your kids. You talk and talk and talk all the time. They never listen to you, right? It, all of a sudden, our kids can now hear us. And, and so it's, it's the advancement of science here is unbelievable. And so again, another area of where the combination of, and, and these algorithms uh, that are driving this uh, uh, therapy um, changes are all AI based. And, and the, it, the advancements here are, are, are really unbelievable. So, so these are a couple examples. And then two more, uh, we have a sensor uh, that we put under the skin for AFib. And, and again, uh, using AI, uh, we are able to be, make that, that, that signal much more sensitive and specific um, because one of the issues that we have right now is that we send physicians too much data when it comes to cardiology and they don't want to do with it. And, and they'd rather have information than a bunch of data. Insightful information than mounds and mounds of data. And so now using AI, we're able to screen out false positives, false negatives uh, to a large degree here, 84%, and provide physicians with you know, real time, uh, actionable clinical data and, and it's, it's really having a huge impact on our ability to manage uh, patients with AFib. And then another one that's, you know, for those of you that are 45 and above, near and dear to you, uh, is colonoscopies. Uh, and so the traditional colonoscopy, uh, one thing I've learned about colonoscopies, get the colonoscopy in the morning, not in the afternoon, because surgeons' eyes get tired, they miss these things. I don't know if you've ever seen a colonoscopy film. It's, it, from my perspective, not a physician, it looks like a lot of pink tissue, and I don't know what they're looking at. Uh, and, but there's all kinds of potential problems in there. And what we found is the AI, through years of, of, of taking these recordings and training algorithms, the AI is, is way better than the human eye at picking out these polyps. And so today, we just recently released in the US algorithms that are running alongside the physicians and we're finding 26% more polyps than the physicians. And those polyps can lead to cancer. So it's, it's having a big impact and then where we're going with it is, is taking your, your colonoscopy and putting it into a pill. So all that, uh, again, this gets to the confluence of imaging and, and, and Bluetooth, and here's the pill right here. You see it on the, on the screen. This is your colonoscopy. You swallow this pill. The images, it images your, 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 your colon. The images are beamed to your phone. You can't see them on your phone, but then it's, a, it's, put, it's beamed into the cloud, and that's where your colonoscopy happens. That's where the AI happens, and then if you actually have something, then we would direct you to go in and get a traditional therapeutic colonoscopy. But you know, seven out of 10 people uh, you know, that get a colonoscopy are, are clean and don't need to do that. So we're creating all kinds of, of, of access. Here's an example of where we're creating, we're lowering costs to the healthcare system. So seven out of 10 patients don't need to get that anesthesia, don't need to go into the hospital here with, and, and, and with two surgeons and a bunch of techs. That's a very expensive procedure. Uh, and we're creating all kinds of capacity, all kinds of access uh, to screening that uh, some patients wouldn't otherwise have. And you're getting better outcomes because the AI is picking out these polyps and, and other issues better than physicians. So it's, 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 a very, it's a very exciting, you can see the confluence of technology here. Um, I wish it would move a little faster, but, but it, it is moving. And we're doing this now in the UK because uh, coming out of, out of um, you know, coming out of uh, COVID, they had such a, a, a line, a waiting line of, of colonoscopies. The NHS was afraid of a big bolus of colon cancer. So they, they, they deployed this 
for thousands of patients in, uh, in the UK. And so you can see how a real world application of it. And then finally, what this is allowing, all of this technology is allowing care to be remotely delivered. You know, so um, that, that we're seeing that as well. For us, we're training physicians remotely. We're proctoring cases remotely. Uh, physicians, uh, this is qu not quite, that's becoming more standard. This is still early stages, but you know, physicians actually you know, doing surgical procedures remotely. That's still, uh, I think, a ways away personally, but, um, but these are options that are available to us. So a lot of exciting things. And uh, again, it, it, it does take though, um, you know, some, some you know, kind of remember your past, remember that, like I talked about how Medtronic was started, that collaboration between that physician and that engineer, that hasn't gone away. We still need that but we've got to bring in some different technologies. We've, call, we've called it putting the tech in med tech, so we've got to move beyond the, the biomedical engineering. That's a, a core part of it, but bringing in data science, bringing in embracing new communication methodologies and 5G and how that changes things. So it's forcing us to learn new things. It's, it's driving you know, new partnerships. Uh, what you see here on the right, you know, we're, we spend a lot of time with um, you know, the tech companies whether it be you know, consumer electronics like Apple or communications companies like Verizon with 5G or cloud companies like Amazon or computing companies like Intel and, and, and Microsoft has a combination of many of those things. And of course, collaborations uh, you know, with, with, with research institutions like the University of Minnesota, bringing that all together. And it, like I said before, it is still a, innovation is still a people-powered business. So let's not forget that. The tech, putting the tech in the med tech does take you know, people and take, it, it comes down to that in partnerships. And that's what, you know, one of the things that we're doing more of at Medtronic are these type of collaborations around the world with health systems, with technology companies, with uh, universities, because uh, there's so much happening so quickly. Um, you know, we're converging a lot of these technologies, but we can't, you know, I, I, we can't do this by ourselves. The industry can't do it by ourselves. So I, I see a resurgence, actually, of these type of collaborations, these type of partnerships, which is why it's so exciting to be here today. And we have a solid foundation at the U, but I think we can take it to a, another level. And, um, you know, looking forward to uh, a, a good dialogue with you. And, 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 but I'll end where I, I kind of started and talked, talked about in the middle. I think with the changes that we're seeing, we are on the precipice of a new paradigm here in, in healthcare, the idea of, of delivering personalized care in an efficient way at scale is, is really right in front of us. And you're starting to see this play out in different ways. Uh, and it's an exciting industry to be part of. And you know, it's, but a lot of these ideas come from conferences like this and collaborations like this. And, and just wanna thank you for you know, prioritizing this conference and coming here and, and, and listening to, hear, to me today. And I look forward to uh, some Q&A here. So thank you.